Sometimes he seems so distant, so different. Is he even real? What if that transcendent, holy, glorious creator of the universe wanted to meet us? What if we could know him, not just know about him, but actually know him? Encountering God. A new series at Stapleton Church. All right, good morning, everyone. It's so good, good to see you. My name is Matt Wolf. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are going to have a good encounter with God today. You guys excited about that? This is a really profound one. This is a powerful story that we're going to look at today. And in this series, we've been looking at some of the encounters that we have as human beings with God, these powerful moments. And we're going to see this one in Isaiah that I think is going to rock your world. So you guys ready for that? You ready to get rocked a little bit? Good, yeah. Good, I want to I see that, um, because today we're talking about holiness. Now, even just saying the word holiness, holy, I think most of us are like, not me. <laughs> holy? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I know what I did. I know who I am. I know the way I think and feel. Oh, holy, that's not one of the words used to describe me. And I think especially we think that when we look at, at some other Christians. We see people serving. We see people up on stage and they're leading worship or preaching. We see people serving all different ways and missionaries. And we're like, man, they're the holy people. They're the righteous people. No wonder they can do that. But me? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm holy, yeah. That's the last thing that would use to describe me. But I think that when we think that way, we're getting things backwards. We're only understanding maybe half of the story, and we're not understanding the full breadth of the gospel. And even though it's an Old Testament story we're looking at today, we are going to see the gospel in full today, a powerful moment, an encounter with the divine, holy God of the universe. So I hope you're ready for that. In this series, we've been looking at these encounters. We have this one and just a couple more encounters left. And then on Easter, we're actually going to have our final, final encounter with God in our series. And then the week after that, we are, we are going to start a series through the book of Ecclesiastes. And right now, I, I'm calling that series, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You like that? Uh, I'm getting really excited about that series. It's going to be fun too, so get excited about that. But these encounters are so good. These are so good. So I want you to take your Bible and open with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And if you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on a smartphone, tablet, and we'll have the main verses of our passage up here on the screen as well so you can read along with us as we see this powerful encounter that Isaiah has with a holy God. So in Isaiah chapter 6, we start in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died. You guys remember that, right? <laughs> we could barely name our U.S. presidents, let alone the kings of Israel, right? Let's be honest. Who the heck is Uzziah? To make it even more complicated, in the book of Chronicles, his name is Uzziah, but in the book of Kings, his name is like Azariah. So it makes it even more confusing. When did this person live? We don't know. There's two kingdoms going on at the same time. Who knows who the heck this person is? Uzziah is maybe his nickname. I don't know. We don't really know. He had those two names. But Uzziah was actually an interesting king. And I want to stop here just for a second because we have to understand this setting so we understand where Isaiah is coming from, what's going on in this time period. Now, Uzziah was actually a pretty good king, which was rare. If you look through the kings of Israel and of Judah, because God's nation was divided in two for a long time, both sets of kings in both nations were pretty awful. They did terrible stuff. They were bad people. But Uzziah was actually a good dude. He was a good, faithful king, and he did what God asked him to do. And because of that, God blessed him greatly. And he won all sorts of battles and wars, and the nation expanded. Times were good under Uzziah. But then it says that things kind of got to his head. Literally, Uzziah was someone who became very prideful. Things were so good. He was such a good person. He was a righteous, holy guy, right? That he thought he was great. And he did what other kings in history have done, that he said, hey, it's not just for enough for me to have power over the military and over the nation. I want power over God, too. We, we know that other kings like King Henry VIII did this when he wanted a divorce and the Catholic Church was saying no. He just said, okay, I'll start my own church, right? Remember that in history? So that he could have his eight wives? Yeah. Uh, that guy is maybe not quite as holy. Um, but Uzziah there was like, hey, I I'm such a good guy. Why can't I go into the temple of God? Now, the temple was the building, the house that King David had built. I'm sorry, King Solomon had built, David's son, for 
the God of Israel, to reside in, to live in his holy presence. And the whole temple was holy. There was an outer court where people can go in, and then there was an inner part of the temple, and then there was a very inside place called the Holy of Holies. And only the, the temple priests were allowed in there, and only the high priest really could go in there. But Uzziah thought, hey, I'm a holy guy. I'm a good guy. Why can't I go do that? So he went into the temple, and he lit some incense. You may think, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, God had explicitly made in his law that said only the priests, only the people from a certain family lineage could do this. And he said, meh, I'm going to do it anyways. Then the priests come to him and they say, hey, 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 but you you should probably stop doing this. I don't think this is a good idea, Uzziah. I know you're a good king, but, but hey, I think you should stop doing this. And he said, no, I'm doing it. And right then, in that moment, he caught leprosy. Now, this isn't the leprosy that we talk about today with Hansen's disease. This was some kind of skin condition that turned the face ashen and white. It is even described as like snowy, so very ashen. And his face started to break out in this, and it covered his whole body. And because of that, he was not only probably unseemly, he was probably ugly because of this skin condition, but that made him unholy. He was considered unclean according to the law, and he couldn't even live in his palace from that day on, let alone go in the temple. He was basically ostracized from the community and had to finish out the rest of his days there. In the temple, King Uzziah, the great leader, seemingly holy, he went in and did something pridefully and was struck by God with a disease. And then he dies. I think that image of Uzziah, because it's such a fresh image of the funeral happening, and I mean, a head of state dying like that, that's a pretty big deal. So that's fresh in Isaiah's mind as this is happening, and the the good king, probably the only good king in centuries, had just died, and he had had a pretty poor end at that. To make matters even worse, there's this nation that just a few years ago had started to rise to power and prominence called Assyria. You may know it as the nation that destroyed Israel. (laughs) Yeah, it would be just a few years after this that Assyria would come in and wipe out God's people. And the Assyrians were rising to power, and they were very brutal, awful people. When they captured people, they tortured them. And these Assyrians were starting to rise to power, taking country after country. So all this is happening at the same time in the year that King Uzziah died, and Isaiah is there, and he has this vision of God. He has this vision of God. So let's read it as we finish verse 1. Isaiah wrote, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, And the train of his robe filled the temple. So this is a vision that Isaiah is having. He's seeing this. Now this is one of the ways that people have encounters with God, with visions like this. Maybe it's rare, maybe you've never had one, but God does show up in all sorts of different ways, and we've seen this in our series. And here is one of those different ways. It's not an audible voice like we saw with Samuel a couple weeks ago. It's not uh, something visual that's happening in front of him like we've seen in some of our other stories. Uh, messages in this series, not a burning bush. It's a vision. And Isaiah sees this vision of the temple. And in this temple, there's a throne, and there's someone on the throne. And this someone is so powerful, so immense, that just the train of his robe is filling the entire temple. You can't see his face, you can't see his body, just the train. And this is probably the hem of his robe. It wasn't a train like at a wedding, right? It's not something that somebody carried behind him. This is just the hem of the robe that this king is wearing on the throne. Now, if you know about the temple, there, was there a throne in there? Well, actually, there was. The Ark of the Covenant, that great golden box that melts your face, not really, but you know what I'm talking about. That great golden box that they made to put in the Ten Commandments, on top of it were these two angel figurines carved out of gold, and they would have their wings outstretched so as to form basically a throne or a footstool of a throne. So on this throne is seated this gargantuan mammoth vision of God, the Lord. And just, his, just, just the hem of his robe is filling the entire temple. So can you imagine how immense this God is? This little building cannot contain him. It's filling the temple there. And then it goes on in verse 2. Isaiah wrote, Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. What? I told you there's some bizarre ones, right? 
What is going on here? Now, seraphim are only mentioned here in the entire Bible. The word is used a few other times, and it's a word that could either mean um, fire or it could mean serpent. Interesting. So people have a guess of what these look like, but we don't really know. These are angels. These are creatures that God created. Now, you may know another term. In a couple weeks, we'll see in Ezekiel the cherubim named. Maybe you've heard that phrase, cherubim and seraphim. Maybe you've even sung that song when you were cherubim and seraphim. Do you remember that song? These are two different types of angels. Now, if you're like, oh, I didn't know there were two different types. Maybe there's more. I don't know. There's archangels described. I mean, if God was creative enough to create all the different varieties of fish and dogs and, and cats, if you like those, that kind of thing, if God was able to make all those kinds of species and subspecies, why can't he make more than one type of angel? You'd think a creative God like God could do that, right? Well, that's what he did. And so there's at least two different types of angels mentioned in the Bible, and these ones have six wings, not the two that we're used to seeing in pictures. Interesting. These are the seraphim, and these ones are, are maybe especially holy because they're there in the throne room of God with six wings. And I do just want to throw this out here. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches that human beings become angels. I know that's going to rock some people's world, and that's not what I'm talking about with rocking your world, but nothing in the Bible teaches us we're going to become angels. They're a separate created being from humans. We're actually going to be better than angels. Seriously, it says that. We're going to be greater than angels when we die and make it into heaven. We're going to be given new bodies like Jesus. I would rather much be like Jesus than like an angel. I can tell you that much. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Just a little uh, bonus point there. But there's these seraphim, and they're, they're flying, and, and it says these six wings they have. Two are just covering their faces. Two are covering their feet. We saw back with Moses when Moses wanted to come closer to the burning bush where God was showing up in this bizarre way. He had to take off his sandals because his feet were dirty, and that was unholy, and this was holy ground because God was there. In the same way, these angels, angels had to cover their own feet and their face. Their face because they could not even look at God. And their feet because even they were not holy enough to be in God's presence. Amazing. You see this image, and I just want you to picture that in your mind. Maybe you don't know, well, well what did the seraphim look like? We don't know. But this is a powerful moment that even these angels, these seraphim, have to hide their face because the vision of God is so powerful. No one can look at him. In verse 3, we read, And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, we read, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. This is a powerful moment. At just the sound of these angels crying out, declaring praise, holy, holy, holy to the God Almighty, to each other. The whole temple shakes. Smoke is filling there. And we know that smoke is often a representative of God's presence. This is something so powerful that it's palpable. It's shaking the doorpost. And this is what Isaiah sees in this vision of God. He can feel it. Now, I think it's so interesting that these angels are saying holy, holy, holy. Now, the word holy could be translated as set apart. This is something unique and special and different. Yes, it means perfect. Yes, it means without flaw. But this is something so different than everything else. There's human beings, there's our planet, there's creatures, there's the universe, all over here, and then God is over here. Separate, distinct, holy, he is one of a kind, unlike anyone and anything else. Even the angels are separate. They have to hide their face from this holy God. And they don't just say holy once, they say it twice. No, even more than that, they say it three times. I think that's interesting because the holy of holies, the place, the inner sanctuary of the temple, had two holies, right? But this is the holiest of holies, God himself. I can't imagine what it would be like for Isaiah to witness this, to see this. Holy, holy, holy. The angels cry out to each other. 
And I think that's profound in itself, too. These angels know God. They've been serving God since they were created. And yet they continue to have to say, holy, holy, holy. Why? Because he is that holy that he makes you, if you're in his presence, proclaim his greatness. Have you ever been around someone great and you just cheer? You get excited when you go see your favorite band? It almost comes unbidden out of you? Even for these angels, just to be near God, praise comes out. He's that powerful and profound. We would probably gasp. We would fall on our knees as you see in other encounters with God in the Bible. But I want you to see what Isaiah says in this moment. Verse 5. Isaiah says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And his eyes have only just seen the hem of his robe, right? He's seen this smoke, and yet even then he knew that he was nothing. He was so separate and distinct that he is unholy compared to this holy God. Woe to me! I am ruined! He thought for sure he would be destroyed because he knew God was perfect and he was not. He knew every single sin he had committed. He felt the guilt that he had carried because of all the things wrong he'd done, even though Isaiah was probably already a prophet at this point, we think. And yet he knows, I am no one. I am nothing to be in the presence of this God, whom even the angels can't look at. Woe to me, I am ruined. Isaiah said. Now, I think this is a profound, powerful moment. And if we, too, come into contact with this holy, divine God, we will have a similar sense. We will realize that we are unholy. We are sinful. We have all sorts of flaws next to the flawless, perfect God. I remember one time I was painting in our last house and uh, we were going to paint the ceiling and there were some cabinets attached to the ceilings that we just wanted to take out and get rid of. So I took them out and I noticed, ooh, it's pretty ugly underneath those cabinets, right? Have you, if you've ever done that? They had painted around the cabinets, of course. That's what we do. We said, okay, we've got to paint it. Well, the rest of the ceiling's white. So I'll just get some white paint and I'll just paint that one spot. You ever tried to do that? So we got beautiful white, brilliant white. That's a a color, brilliant white. And we took it and we put it up there, and what happened? It didn't match. It made the rest of the white look dingy and disgusting and gross. It was yellowish. It looked so awful next to the white brilliance of the new white because there's that contrast. It looked fine before, but not next to what is perfect what is pure. That's what happens when we go before God. When we are next to his holiness, we realize all of our unholiness, our sin, our flaws, our imperfections, our pride. I have a two-part big idea for you today, and this first part comes from this, this first section. It's that God's holiness reveals our sin. Nothing will be more powerful for you to realize, actually, I have a lot of problems, a lot of issues, a lot of sin in my life. Nothing will impact you more than standing or being in God's presence. You know, sometimes people are afraid to go to church. They're like, oh, it'll burn up if I go. Or or they walk in for the first time into a brand new church, and they're like, everybody was looking at me and judging me. Nobody knew you, but you feel guilty, right? You know what I'm talking about. Some of you feel that way this morning. It's not me. It's God's Holy Spirit. In fact, we're told that the Holy Spirit's job is to convict the world. God's powerful presence, when you just go anywhere near it, even just seeing about God's holiness, it makes you feel unholy. Because God's holiness reveals our sin. It is the bright, brilliant white next to our dingy, disgusting taupe. Something far worse than that. That's what happens when we're next to the holiness of God. I am ruined, we should say. 
I am ruined. We feel so sinful. You know, uh, us preachers have a problem with our world today. Nobody thinks they're sinners. I'm serious. Yeah, there are some people that grew up in church and still feel guilty, and they feel guilted, oh my gosh. But most people today are like, eh, I'm not that bad. Some of you are even saying that. Matt, I, you're talking about sin, but I'm not that bad. Woe to me, I am ruined. I, yeah, I've done a few bad things, but look at that guy. We always have someone worse that we can think of, right? Yeah, I might have cheated on my taxes, but at least I didn't cheat that much. Right? We always have someone to look, because what we do is we grade on a curve. <laughs> we do, we grade on a curve. Do you remember that in school when they graded on a curve? I remember a calculus test. Man, that was a tough class. I'm not a math guy, or I realized then that I was not a math guy. It's a calculus test, I got it back, and it was like a 37%, and I was like, oh my gosh, I've never scored this bad on a test. I thought I was a good student, 37, and I still got a B. How is that possible? <laughs> but because I was graded on a curve, everybody else in the class stunk too, I guess. That's what a curve does. You compare yourself to everybody else, and you're like, oh, I'm doing pretty good. Look at those guys. But guess what? God doesn't grade on a curve. He grades compared to himself. And if he is holy, perfect, righteous, without flaw, and you go anywhere near him, you realize, whoa, I am much, 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 much worse than I ever could have imagined. You are far more sinful than you think, and your sin is much worse than you think. R.C. Sproul, in his book, Holiness of God, great book on this subject, he said that the problem with our sin, we think it's not that bad, everybody does it, oh, these things are okay, you know. Even our, our society says some things are good that the Bible says are bad. We say it's not that big of a deal. But our sin is actually cosmic treason. Think about it. We're worse than Benedict Arnold. Because we have a king of the universe who loves us and has given us so much, has blessed us beyond measure, and we say, mm, I think I know better than you. I think I'm going to do it my way and not your way. It's cosmic treason that we're committing again and again and again. There's, there's, there's another German theologian, Hans Kuhn, who says the, the question about the mystery of sin should not be, why does God destroy sinners? It should be, why doesn't God destroy me? Why does he let any sinner live? Why does he let any prideful person even stay king? Why did he just send Uzziah out of his presence and be ostracized because of that sin? No, no, no. Why didn't he just smite him down right there? Smote, smitten, whatever. Why didn't he strike us all down? That should be the real question we're asking ourselves. Why has God spared me so far? That's the real question. Our sin is far worse than we think. It is cosmic treason. So I want you to see this, and I want you to realize that that is exactly what Isaiah ran into because God is perfect. Uh, one metaphor that you can even think of is like the sun. If you go near the sun, what's going to happen? You're going to burn up. In fact, in 1 Timothy, Paul writes, in 1 Timothy 6.16, Paul says, God, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. This unapproachable light, this God who is so holy and other that if we were to even go near him, we would fall on our knees, cry, woe to me. Isaiah is a prophet. Me? Our flaws, our sin is all revealed before the holiness of God. Now, I think, sadly, a lot of people kind of stop there with the Christian message. They're like, that's all there is, right? You're all sinners, you're guilty, you're going to hell. And if you do stop right there, we all would leave here feeling, man, man, I'm terrible. I know what I did. I know what I am doing. I know again and again I keep doing this thing that I know is wrong, but I do it anyways. Let alone live up to God's perfect standards. I can't do it. Especially if we're going to talk about serving God or doing things for him. Yeah, right. But thankfully, that's not the end of this story, is it? It's not the end of this story because Isaiah says that what happened next is powerful. He says that the seraphim flew and they went up and they picked up with tongs some hot coals. 
they picked up these hot coals and then they flew to Isaiah as he's there exclaiming, Woe to me, I'm ruined. And we pick this up in verse 7. It says that one of these seraphim, with the tongs with a hot coal in it, with it he touched my mouth, cauterizing his lips, searing them. Remember he had said, my lips are unclean. I have spoken, I have said things that are sinful. I have done things that are sinful. That's what he's saying. And with it the seraphim touches and cauterizes his mouth and says, see, this angel says, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. In this one instant, in this one millisecond, the angel declares what is true. Yeah, you're a sinner. Did you notice he didn't say, oh, you're not that bad. I know what your parents did to you. The fact that you're this good, wow, you've really come far. The angel doesn't say anything like that. The angel acknowledges, yeah, you are sinful, and I need to atone for your sin. Something has to be done to forgive you. And this angel touches his lip, cauterizing his lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. In that instant, in that millisecond, all his guilt and sin is gone forever by this one powerful act. Now that's incredible. That's incredible. The sins are all the things that have fallen short of God's glory, of his perfection. And they are atoned for in a moment. That word atoned, uh, Billy Graham used to say, an easy way to remember is that we are at one with God. Right? Atoned at one with God. In that moment, we have this reconciled relationship and we can be in the presence of that perfect holy God. All our sins are taken away and removed for us in the act of atonement. We are made at one. And God, through the angels, is saying that happened in that millisecond all your sins removed all your imperfections covered over and then what happens next is really cool in in verse 8 Isaiah writes then I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us and I said here am I send me Do you see the difference in what happened in that millisecond to Isaiah? The first second, he's saying, woe to me, I'm ruined, I'm going to be dying, I'm going to be destroyed, God is going to smite me down right here, everything is gone, oh no, it's helpless, I've done too much wrong, I'm guilty, I'm sinful. And then in the next second, he says, God, I'll do whatever you want, I'll be your messenger to the world. Do you see the difference in one millisecond all that has changed and now Isaiah isn't saying woe to me he's saying here I am I'll put my hand up I'll go and do whatever you want God I can be your servant to your people send me here I am I love the transformation that happens in Isaiah in just that moment this is what I want you to see I told you there's two parts of this big idea the first one of course is that God's holiness reveals our sin, but here's the second part. But forgiveness lets mission begin. Did you catch that? God's holiness reveals our sin. Makes us feel worthless. How could I do anything? Woe to me. I should be destroyed right now. But his forgiveness lets mission begin. There's something powerful and profound that happens in the moment of forgiveness that says it's not even just for me. I've got to go tell other people about this. And that's what Isaiah would go on to do, even though God would tell him, hey, Isaiah, nobody's going to listen to you. That's literally the message. Hey, you go preach them, tell them that they need to repent, and nobody's going to listen to you. And what a great mission that he had, right? But we have a mission, too, in the same way, that we're sent out, and this holiness transforms us. And it's not even like, this is what you have to do now. It's what you get to do. God lets mission begin. Uh, Did you see how Isaiah was just this willing volunteer? I'll do whatever you want. I'll go wherever you want, God. We do the same thing. When you eat at a good restaurant, you're telling everybody about it. When you go to see a good doctor, you're going to tell all your friends, oh, you've got to go to this doctor. They help me so much. When even businesses, you have this interaction with them. Oh, they're great. I'm going to post about this on Facebook. I'm going to tell everyone. They don't even have to say anything. Because when something good happens to us, we want to let other people know, right? 
When something as powerful as all of our sins being taken away from our, our guilt gone forever, we're going to naturally say, how could I not tell everybody about that? And that's what happens to Isaiah. And in the same way, we might not be the messengers, the prophets like Isaiah to tell people that they're going to repent and nobody's going to listen to us. Actually, people will probably listen to us because we'll talk from personal experience. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul would say that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We are his representatives. That's what I'm talking about by being on mission. We have a mission. Our mission statement here is helping people follow Jesus. That's yours too. To tell people about Jesus. Tell people about the forgiveness of God that's available for everyone no matter how awful and how sinful you are. We're the, that ambassador. We're on a mission. And it's for, his forgiveness that allows us to do that. It's his forgiveness that sends us out. You know, it's a really bizarre thing. There was a, uh, a survey done just this uh, recently, I think this last year, of millennials. I'm one of those millennials. Don't tell anybody. We millennials, almost 50% of us think, not me, but think that in my demographic that are Christians they think that telling people about their faith is wrong. Almost 50% of millennial evangelicals. What? Why, why have we gotten so warped in our mind that telling people that there's forgiveness available for their sins is a bad thing? Man, the world's really messed up our minds. just want to say that because that is weird. If you eat a, a good burger, you're going to tell people. If all your sins are forgiven and there's only one way to eternal life, you better tell people. How could I keep that to myself? How awful would you be? That's wrong to keep your mouth closed. I know this is challenging, but that is what we are called to do. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, once said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. I think what happens is a lot of my generation is kind of second generation or even third generation Christian. It's almost just assumed for us, you went to church, yeah, I believe that, sure. But we haven't had those direct encounters with God. The personal relationship may be missing. And we're like Isaiah maybe before this. But once you encounter this God, this holy, righteous God who is perfect, it changes you, it transforms you. It changes you forever. And then we have to tell people, be wrong not to. Now, as I kind of have the ban come up right now, you know, this, this encounter with God is so powerful. And, and what's really uh, may, been interesting for me is that when Isaiah talks about this Lord in the temple, the train of his realm, he doesn't see his face, we're actually told exactly who that was. Did you know this? In John chapter 12, quoting verses from this passage, if we can show this verse up on the screen. John chapter 12, verse 41. John writes, Isaiah said these things, quoting this chapter, because he saw Jesus' glory. He spoke about Jesus. Did you know that? Isaiah probably didn't even know who he was in the presence of, but that was Jesus himself there before he had come down in human form. But then Jesus did come down to walk and live among us as a human being just like every single one of us. And he lived a holy life. He was righteous. He walked among us and served people. He told them the good news about this kingdom that was coming that they could be a part of. And there's this incredible story in Luke where Jesus is walking by this woman who has had this bleeding disease for 12 years. Do you remember this story? For 12 years, this woman has suffered, and she reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' robe. And in that second, she is healed. Because Jesus was the glory of God incarnate, walking among us, his holiness there for all to see. And what's even more profound is that he gave up all that glory. He emptied himself to become a servant. And they gave him a purple robe and a crown of thorns to mock him, king of the Jews, <laughs> laughable. And then instead of putting him on a throne, they put him on a wooden torture device to execute him. 
But Jesus did that. He gave up all his glory and all his holiness to die for you. One thing that's really uh, been hard for Bible scholars and theologians is that in this passage in Isaiah, it's the only time in the entire Bible where the atonement takes place without a sacrifice. Did you notice that? I think it's because there was a sacrifice yet to come. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he was the final sacrifice. John would later have this vision of Jesus. You may remember this in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. He has this vision where there are these creatures flying with six wings. And they're around a throne. And do you know what they're saying? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And do you know who they were singing to? Do you know who was on that throne? It says a lamb who looked like it had been slain. Do you know who that was? Jesus, the final sacrifice who died for our sins. Do you know why? Because when God says, I want to save the world, all their sin, all their guilt is getting in the way. Do you know what Jesus said? Here I am, send me. And he willingly died on the cross for you. But he rose on the third day and ascended into heaven where he is seated on the throne once again. Can I get a hallelujah? That is where God is right now, reigning in power. So that why when we're looking around and we're seeing our neighbors next to us who don't know Jesus, we can say, here I am, send me. When we're with our families and we're raising our kids and we know that they need to know Jesus when they're at this young age, we say, here I am, send me. I can teach them. I can serve and elevate kids or turbulence on a Wednesday night. If, I can, if we need somebody to serve on a Wednesday night to serve a meal to the homeless, here I am, send me. Not because we are holy, but because we are forgiven. So whether it's to your family or to your friends or to the person next to you or to your waitress this afternoon for lunch, we will say, here I am, send me, right? Not because we are holy, but because God has made us holy. God's holiness only reveals our sin, but forgiveness lets mercy and mission begin. Would you please stand with me? Lord God, we are unholy. We come into your presence and realize we have tons of flaws and we ask for your forgiveness. We ask in the name of your son Jesus who died on the cross in our place, our atonement to forgive us and make us at one with you, Lord God. We claim that right now, that we are forgiven, we are holy, and we will go wherever you send us. Here I am, Lord God, we declare together. Here I am, send me. And I pray, Lord, that you would use us Lord, we surrender to you right now. I surrender. We surrender, Lord. We know that you are a holy God. We are unholy and we need you and we are, we are willing to go wherever you send us. Use us. In Jesus' name, amen.